Uh, uh, delighted to be here, and uh, thank you very much. I'm also going to encourage, please, people ask uh, ask questions through the Q and A. It's a shame this isn't in person, but uh, very very keen to keep the conversation going. What I want to do though today is share uh, three key things. So I'm going to share some data from Skyscanner uh, and what we're seeing. Uh, I want to share some of the traveller research that we've been doing over the last six months, uh, and then probably more importantly. I want to share some of the ideas that we've had, some of the actions that we've taken um, to help our travellers and also to help our partners. Um, and firstly, hopefully a lot of you already know uh, Skyscanner, but just to give a bit of context, uh, I've been with Skyscanner for almost a year. I've been in the travel industry for 10 years, very familiar with Skyscanner, but didn't really realise what sort of scale uh, we operated at. So back in normal times, uh, and sadly, you know, no longer this scale uh, today, but in, in normal times, we had over 100 million unique users a month, um, uh, just huge scale, and also hugely global, actually 24 countries across the world, more than a million unique users uh, every month. Uh, and of course, our business has been hit by COVID. Um, however, we're still seeing literally millions of travelers searching uh, and booking uh, on our site every day. What that means is that we're seeing some really interesting insights that are hidden behind that kind of uh, you know, uh, travel uh, volumes. And I'm going to talk about the three key shifts that we're seeing in terms of search intent and also bookings. And what it boils down to is that we're seeing a big jump in one ways. We're seeing a lot more domestic and short haul uh, travel. And we're also seeing people make much more short term decisions around when they are choosing to search for travel and also uh, book. Um, a lot of detail on these charts, um, and obviously they'll be available uh, afterwards. But the high-level thing that we saw that was obviously expected back in kind of March, April, was this big spike, so kind of year-on-year -year spike of you know up to 30, 40 percent in some countries of interest in one-way travel. And that makes sense, right? That's people back in March, uh, April, just trying to get home. But what we haven't seen is that dip back down. We're still seeing a lot of interest, and I guess it's people trying to figure out where they want to be uh, during this kind of uh, elongated pandemic. So that's one ways. And then we're also seeing a big trend towards domestic and towards short-haul uh, travel. Um, and that is, again, I want to say even accelerating um, uh, throughout the course of the last uh, six months. And of course, that is very much at the expense of international searches. What you can see there is, again, no massive surprise. Back at the beginning of the year, kind of March, April, we saw some initial spikes in international searches. Again, getting home. But actually, over the summer and continuing now, uh, we are seeing a dip uh, in international searches. Um, so some pretty clear trends coming through uh, from the data. And of course, this is data that we're using to run uh, our business and slice and dice with you know, various different views. Um, and then, like I said, what we're also seeing is that people are making very, very short-term uh, decisions. Again, you can see the big spike back in April of people making a lot of travel booking decisions for travel within the next seven days. That dipped down a little bit over the summer, but we're seeing a resurgence of it now for probably different reasons. So this is for within seven days and an even more pronounced trend, actually, for people looking to make decisions for trips within, uh, within a month. So the data is pretty clear. Um, in addition to the data, uh, what we've also done over the last six months is we've actually really ramped up the traveler research that we've been doing. Uh, so we talk to hundreds of travelers uh, every week, uh, and that's through a combination of in-person interviews, uh, traditional market research, uh, through on-site surveys, through other surveys. And if you add it up, we've talked to more than 6,500 travelers uh, across the world uh, over the last six months. And it, it's quite difficult to distill down all of that insight into a few key things, which is why I've put a couple of the traveler comments on the slide for you to read. But there's a couple of really important insights, we think. Um, so one of the big ones is that 25% of the people that we talk to actually are willing to book travel. And there's a lot of detail behind that in terms of people's individual attitudes to, uh, to risk. The three big questions that travelers are asking themselves are firstly just the obvious one, which is, okay, can I actually go, right? Is this country open? Um, and if it is open, what's the quarantine situation gonna be like for me when I return back to my home country? And then the second one, very, very subjective, but it's a big question mark around, um, 
is it safe? And of course, it's very difficult to answer, but also questions like, is it going to feel safe? What's this new experience going to be like? And then actually, we're also still seeing a lot of people very interested in answering the final question, which is, okay, if I make this booking, is my money going to be uh, safe? Um, very clear trends uh, emerging from the data. And there's also very different views, actually, when we look at um, uh, regional trends. Um, and a lot of detail on this uh, picture. But if you look at what it's telling us, it's telling us that there's going to be a multi-speed recovery. And it tells us that what we saw earlier in terms of the travel search trends likely to continue, but actually we're going to see way more domestic travel and also some differences based on uh, different uh, geographies. Um, so what are we doing? Um, well, firstly, again, each traveler has their own risk tolerance. So really, really we see our job as being to provide travelers with transparency so that they can make their own uh, choices. Um, one of the things that it's been great actually to get the support from uh, ATP Co and their airline partners, and thank you for that, is uh, that actually people want to know, uh, is this ticket flexible? Is my money going to be safe? It's been great to be able to surface that data courtesy of the uh, ATP Co. Uh, reassurance, uh, ticket attribute uh, products, very useful to see. Uh, and then, of course, around safety, we're also supporting travellers with the data that they want around uh, travel safety and how that's going to feel. And there's some very basic questions, you know, do I need to wear a face mask on this plane? Are the flight crew going to be wearing PPE? Is this plane going to be clean? Um, we have that now for uh, hundreds of airlines, the vast majority of the airlines who are on Skyscanner, uh, and they have a very positive uh, reaction to that in the consumer testing that we've done. And then the final thing that I'll share is also that we want to do more to support uh, our partners as well as our travelers. And there's two ways that we've been doing that that I want to call out. The first one is that actually a lot of the charts that I've shown you is data that we use to run our business. And actually, we've made that available now to our partners through our Travel Insight Vision product, and slice and dice that data in a bunch of different ways. And we also know that travelers want more transparency on the product that they're buying, which is why we've made, uh, you know, ramped up our efforts to provide fair families and direct booking as well to our travelers. Uh, I am going to hand back to Beth, but again, I'd encourage any questions, and I'll make sure to pick them up in the Q&A. Thank you.